Money Monday edition of Liquid Lunch pregame show. We are in the throes of an Armageddon-like Monday uh, on Friday. I told you if the market's closed below a certain number, like 25000 we could be in for another Black Monday. That's happening. Markets were halted this morning, down 1500 as we speak. The little extra additive that was thrown in over the weekend as a little shocker for the markets. Uh, Russia pulls out of OPEC effectively, uh, causing oil prices in a downward death spiral. Um, oil prices in free fall, along with more reported cases of the coronavirus around the U.S. and uh, including this morning right here in uh, New York City, a whole building was uh, shut down. So uh, those two together have been a, a tempest in a teapot for the markets. Could be a lot lower, so keep your powder dry. Things are on sale, but the sale may get better any minute now. And it uh, gets better by the minute when I'm joined by Frank Morano, my co-host, managing editor, and uh, the guy who makes everything happen here. Frankie, what's happening? Hello there, John. Happy Monday. How was your weekend? My weekend was fine, but I was on pins and needles waiting for Sunday night to see how these futures were indicating. Ah. And uh, if you remember on Friday, I said, uh, any bad news over the weekend, it could be indicating down a 1,000. That's exactly what happened. And now the uh, markets are in free fall. They actually halted the markets this morning. Frankly. I saw that. I saw that. They may uh, stop them again, right? What, does it have to drop another 6%? I think 13% uh. is the next stop point. And... Uh, you know, it seems like, you know, no one believes in this market. Everybody thinks, you know, that who knows when the other shoe is going to drop. And I know you get aggravated with my conspiracy theories, but doesn't it seem coincidental that China and Russia are working on their own currency to trade oil? They call mm. it the, the yuan petrodollar, okay? China puts this biological warfare out into the world to paralyze the global economy, in, in, including the U.S., and then right in the middle of it, while the markets are under massive pressure, uh, Russia, their best buddy in the world, just happens to pull out of OPEC. So it's like, a, it's like a double whammy for the U.S. economy right now. And I'm starting to think more and more that China and Russia are in on this thing together. Well, I mean, it certainly is not a very good thing for the Chinese economy either, though. Well, here's the thing. And, uh, you know, I was talking to somebody very smart about this this weekend. I think China's been lying about their economy for so long that something like this creates an opportunity for them to cover all that up because everybody's down. So it's like, you know, core curriculum. Rather than try to make the dumber students smarter, they try to make the smarter students dumber so that everyone seems equal. So that helps China. And now, as soon as they snap their fingers and say, oh, it's all gone, we're ready to go, they're going to have this huge spike, which is going to look to the to the rest of the world like they're on the road to recovery. So I, I think a lot of this is orchestrated, my friend. I don't know. Well, we'll see what happens. It's going to be interesting. What were you covering on your morning show this morning? The big news uh, of the day had to be the markets, but uh, what well, else is happening know, obviously on that, that AM 970? Well, you know, the markets didn't open until around 930, so uh, we we're almost over by then. But uh, everybody's talking about Super Tuesday 2. All these states, they're going to be voting tomorrow, uh, Michigan being the biggest prize. See if Bernie can uh, get a little bit of his mojo back or if it's uh, clear sailing for Joe Biden from here on in. It looks like um, another uh, former Democratic presidential candidate has uh, gotten in line behind the establishment and Joe Biden. Uh, Cory Booker has decided to jump on the Biden bandwagon and it'll probably have the same effect as it did on Cory's own campaign oh. and uh, nothing. I don't know that his endorsement really means much, but it's probably Good telling... Up in Jersey, right? It's probably telling the establishment, hey, I want a cabinet position if Biden... Well, well I mean, happen. I think ideally he'd like to be the VP. Yeah, I would say so. But I, w I would imagine they got to get a woman in there with Joe. I don't know, Frankie, this, this corona stuff, I think it's just paralyzing people mentally, emotionally. You know, people are not doing much. The city's like ghost town. Uh, I don't know. I, I, we... I think there's more fear, fright, and hysteria created by the media than anything else, and it's having a really negative effect well, on Well, but even the government is uh, adding to a lot of the concerns. You know, today or yesterday, the State Department put out a statement saying people shouldn't go on cruises. Uh, certainly not good news for the cruise industry or the hotel and hospitality industry in general. So you can't blame what the State Department is saying on the media necessarily. Right. And you know what? If you're at home looking at your portfolio, oh my God, look how much money I'm losing. These stocks, the airline stocks, like Frankie said, the cruise lines, the hospitality companies, the Marriott's, the Carnival Cruises, 
you keep your eye on them because this virus is only going to be around for another couple months. As soon as it warms up in the U.S., the threat's going to be gone, and it's 70 in New York today, so we're getting there. But uh, these things are on sale at huge discounts, and if you want to invest in them for the long term, now might be the time to sharpen that pencil. And, you know, if your mind is getting away from you a little bit, thinking about the corona, do I have it? My portfolio's down. The anxiety starts to overtake you. Um, we got just the remedy for that. Dr. Carter Stout joins us. He is a depth psychologist and author of the book Lost in a Ghost Town, Memoir of Addiction, Redemption, and Hope in Unlikely Places. And uh, Dr. Carter, I know we got a lot to talk about. Congratulations on, so on this book, Lost yeah. in Ghost Town. And, um, you know, this book talks about how, you know, regular old middle class, you know, upper middle class white kid winds up, you know, in the hood, in a, in a, driving around with a, with a major gang leader in Venice, California. Yeah. Um, and you basically stop believing that is your lifestyle, mm -hmm. and you go into this spiral of, of drug use, cocaine addiction, and mm -hmm. uh, at some point, the m most unlikely of folks gives you a talking to that turns around your whole life. That's right. That's what, right. Give us the, the background. Fill in the blanks with names and times. Backstory. So, um, I grew up in Washington, D.C. in a fairly affluent family and uh, pretty early on realized that I uh, was enjoying things a little bit too much. And, you know, I, I didn't come from a perfect family, but, uh, but I started using alcohol and drugs kind of in my teen years. And as I got into my 20s, it, it started to become more of an issue for me. I moved out to California, moved to Venice, thinking that it was going to be a good place for me to be, and realized that in Venice at that time, it was the epicenter of the crack cocaine epidemic. Um, and the Shoreline Crips were actually in charge of all of the distribution on the west side. Because I had a car and I, didn't, and I was unemployable at that time, I got a job driving for one of the Shoreline Crips. And, uh, the two of us forged this unlikely friendship. He took me into his home. He introduced me to his grandmother. And in a lot of ways, his family provided for me what my own family hadn't, which was friendship and love and acceptance. And it was because of that that I really started to take stock in my life and, and get straight again. So I think we have a, uh, a little clip yeah. that talks about this and gives some more detail on it. Let's take a look at uh, a little clip trailer from uh, Lost in Ghost Town. I was lost in the tunnel of addiction. And there was no light at the end of it. There were the junkies looking to score, and the scammers trying to swindle, and the dealers trying to get you hooked. They had all become my tribe. I looked at myself in the cracked mirror. The boy with the golden smile was gone. And I missed him. My friend, quite the uh, compelling story. Amazing group of folks that you know actually wrote a little snippet for you. Yeah. You know all these Gwyneth Paltrow, Billy yeah. Crudup, all the, all these uh, major stars, Jason yeah. Blum. Yeah. Uh, how does a guy go from banging around with some gangbangers to getting all these celebrities to make you know contribute quotes for your book? Right. Well, interestingly enough, before I became seriously addicted. I was living here in New York City, just a couple miles from where we are right now, and uh, was involved in the, in the movie business for a little while. Made some independent movies and became friends with a lot of the folks that, that gave me endorsements back then. Of course, for the next decade, they weren't really in my life, but when I came around and I started putting my life back together, uh, I reached out to them and they were all really happy to see how I was doing. Um, I, uh, you know, the, the, the way I straightened myself out was a fairly traditional way. I, I was fortunate enough to go to treatment for a number of months, 
And then while I was in treatment, I decided that California was not a safe place for me to go back. And I applied to graduate school, spent the next 10 years in school getting my PhD in psychology, and I became a psychologist. Um, of course, uh, my family wasn't involved in my life at that time. It took me a long time to rectify that. But they, um, so I put myself through school, worked two, three jobs, took out student loans, and uh, 10 years later, I uh, was able to become a psychologist and start a practice, and now I'm out in LA and trying to help people through similar things that I went through. Well, it's a uh, it's an amazing you know journey you've Thank been you. on. That's Thank for sure. Much. And uh, you know well, I want to get to the addiction part, but yeah. you know you're a psychologist, and sure. right now you know this this stuff that's going on with the coronavirus and the markets. Yeah. is having a major psychological effect on the masses. Definitely. And are these times when people's anxiety get like to them a little bit too much, they maybe start to abuse some little medications they have around? Are these sure. those type of moments? Well, they certainly. I mean, whenever anyone is under a lot of stress, um, they're feeling a lot of anxiety, they tend to maybe over-medicate a bit. And what I would say is that the reason that people are panicking so much is because there's so much information out there some of it misinformation, people don't know who to trust, who to turn to. And what I would say is, uh, speak to your doctor, the person that you trust, the person that you've been with for your life, your family doctor. Well, what makes you think any of us trust our doctor? Well, that's the well, that's well, well hopefully you do, maybe you don't. Nah, my doctor's the best. He's right, buddy, so if but. you have a relationship with somebody, a close relationship, uh, turn to them, uh, ask them what's going on. Another way to really uh, alleviate some of that stress is, I say go directly to the CDC, you know, the Center for Disease Control. CDC? Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> go right to them? Well, no, don't, don't go right to them. Go to their website. Ah. Uh, read about what's going on um, because they're not, I, I don't believe they're a politicized organization. They're how do you, how, do, how does like, you know, a white kid from D.C. find enough street cred to work your way into being in the most intimate of relationships with a, a gang leader? It's interesting, you know, this guy that I developed a friendship with was not like a typical gangbanger. He, he grew up, he was self-educated, he was well-read, he was compassionate, kind, generous, and family-oriented. He was brought up by his grandmother, and uh, in a lot of ways we had similarities in our life, even though we came from completely different backgrounds. He was abandoned by his father, I was abandoned by my father, my mother was an alcoholic, his mother left him when he was a kid. So we had a lot in common, you know, about, uh, uh, about our humanity. And uh, because of that, we became friends. And because he endorsed me and had my back, he introduced me to all of these people, and he kept me safe in that world. Wow. Like yeah. the celebrities, too, who wrote in your book? Uh, that You met them through... No, no, no. The celebrities I met in my book uh, that, that have endorsed my book were people that I knew... I've sort of lived two lives. The first life was movie producer, independent film producer in the 90s in New York. And that's when I met a lot of these folks. And then um, when my addiction really started to hit, that was around 2000. And that's when I moved out to California and, and started to hang out with these, these folks from the Shoreline Crips, yeah. Uh, Carter, or if I can call you Carter, or yeah, Dr. Course, Steph, yeah. I'm really looking forward to reading the memoir. It's gotten great reviews. Uh, everybody has been talking about that. And certainly, if you look at what's happening, not only with this Ben Affleck movie that's in theaters yeah. that everyone's talking about, but what's happening in the country and the world at large, never been uh, a more relevant subject. I'm wondering if you can describe for folks um, what your experience was the first time you tried crack cocaine. I think a lot sure. of people in our audience can... Uh, empathize with what it's like to get drunk. A lot of people understand what it's like to maybe even smoke marijuana. But I don't know that everybody in our audience has done crack. And right. I'm wondering if you can share your experience and what a game changer that was like for you. Sure. You know, what's interesting about that first experience was that uh, it was introduced to me by a, you know, a, a white guy who grew up in Greenwich. And he, he said, you know, let's get some crack. And I said, what? No, no way. Isn't that like a street drug? And he said, no, no, no. It's, it's great. And we had done cocaine before together just in, in powder form. And uh, I tried it, and it was like an immediate uh, rush that overtook my whole body and my whole senses. And it was different from 
uh, the cocaine that I'd done before with the intensity of it. And it was something that uh, almost immediately after I tried it, I wanted to do it again. So it really just uh, got. So how long does it take to hit you? Immediately. Immediately. Uh, when the when the you smoke enters your lungs. You take a, you take a lungs, few puffs on the crack pipe. That's right. And then all of a sudden, and all of within a sudden seconds, yeah. That's you're the, Superman. You're Superman. You want yeah, to run, I felt. jump, do cartwheels, backflips, jump over you cars. Felt, I mean, you, you feel this euphoria, and it was... It's like a dopamine release. Exactly. A, a lot of dopamine release, um, and it was something that I'd never experienced before, and I wanted more of it. How long does it last? Really. It lasts about 10 minutes. That's it? That's in it. And that's why people are constantly trying to chase that high, and, you know, it's... It's not that expensive, but you run out of money, and then people do things like... Get that rock. Yeah, you know, they, the rock. They, they get involved in crime to do it, yeah. What do you think about... Um, I keep doing more and more research on these, on these friggin' video games that mm -hmm. all these kids are playing, right? Yeah. And when I look into, like, the Fortnite and all this stuff, yeah. um, it turns out that behind these companies, like Epic Games and stuff, who make these things, they got these world-renowned psychologists and psychiatrists that are on the board and they're part of it. And the way I'm reading it, these games have no end, mm -hmm. right? So it's, it's like crack, right? There's no end, as sure. long as you can get money, right? Sure. And you wanna achieve the next level, the next level, the next level. And they basically rig them psychologically so that the kid, his skill level can just about get him to the next level. Mm -hmm. And then he gets that dopamine release, yay. Of but then he's got to put in mom's car, credit card to get more lives to go for the next level. And mm -hmm. are these games almost, you know, mind training these kids to seek that dopamine release like, a de like addicts well, there, do? Well, there's certainly a component of that, absolutely. I mean, they want to, these the people that are making these games want to keep kids engaged as long as possible. And it's, you know, it's a... It's a business, so they're trying to get people to give their credit cards. And I mean, it's the same with, with uh, social media, with our cell phones. I mean, there's uh, so much addiction. You see people, I was, I was uh, in Brooklyn yesterday, and I saw this guy walking across the street looking at his phone in, in the midst of traffic coming either way, and he almost got hit. I'm sure that happens in the city, but people are glued to their phones. Kids are, are, are really um, you know, engaging in these video games. And uh, there's addiction, the energy of addiction is really a cultural thing, and it's all around us. Um, and uh, people have uh, addiction to exercise, addiction to food, addiction to sex, addiction to work, addiction to pretty much almost everything you can imagine. But uh, the companies that are creating these games are specifically targeting these kids so that they will uh, People have addiction to sex? Addiction to sex. Is yeah. men mostly? Uh, men and women. Addiction really? to porn, pornography. Um, you know, it's so readily accessible to people. They go on. Uh, you know, Dr. Stout, I'm curious about your perspective. I mean, last year, thankfully, the number of drug overdose deaths in this country went down for the first time in a long, long time. But uh, just before that, uh, we had the deadliest uh, year that we've ever had in terms of drug overdose deaths. More people are dying of drug overdoses in this country still than died in the entire Vietnam War. More people dying every year of drug yeah. overdose deaths uh, than died in the entire Vietnam War. And what we saw up until last year was more people dying of drug overdose deaths than at the height of the crack e epidemic mm -hmm. in the 80s. I'm curious, what do you think has caused the recent uptick in drug use in general and in opioid use specifically? Well, the way that opioids were delivered uh, in Oxycontin was, is, is somewhat responsible for the large spike. It was distributed, it was marketed as a wonder drug. People started to get addicted to it very quickly. It, it, uh, within a week, you can become physically addicted to, to opiates. And it was readily prescribed by doctors for minor injuries, but and there were all of these doctors around the country that were making a lot of money, just giving uh, prescriptions out. Um, the um, the other real problem that exists right now is that the system of treatment in this country is really flawed. The treatment centers uh, mostly are insurance-based right now because people can't afford to 
shell out 20 grand, grand, 30 yeah, grand, exactly. whatever it is. And the insurance companies are consistently denying people coverage. Yep. Um, I don't know that how they can really do that legally, but they've found a loophole and they decide, oh, well, we're going to... Uh, we're going to approve coverage for this person for 11 days. Well, 11 days is not enough time for somebody to recover from opioid addiction. I know because not only was I addicted to cocaine, but also heroin. And it took me several months uh, to, to, to really get it out of my system and get the support that I needed. So the insurance companies right now are denying claims left and right. People go to rehab, they get kicked out. I'll tell you, you know what they do, right? They, they deny, like... The worst of them, you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I think, personally. Because they know those people are, in that loophole, there is an appellate process where, mm -hmm. you know, someone who's of sound mind can go back to the, you know, the healthcare provider and say, I'm appealing your decision, mm -hmm. and here are the reasons why, and here are my rights, and yeah. then they, people win their appeals. Well, they do, but it takes a long time, But right? I'm saying these people who are vulnerable and they're cracked out, they're sure. whacked out, they don't even have the state of mind to go and of do course. the whole appeal process. So they don't need a loophole. They just make the people default themselves out of the system. That's, That's really right. what happens. It's That's really, absolutely true. It's diabolical. It's, it's not diabolical. a loophole. It's a diabolical And, and you know, the I worked in the treatment community in Los Angeles for a number of years at a, a place up in Malibu. Um, and the place, unfortunately, has closed down now. And the insurance companies stopped paying the treatment facilities, stop reimbursing uh, because, you know, you, you take someone in and you count on the insurance company to reimburse you. And the owner of this facility, uh, it was a good friend of mine, he, um, he had to shut his doors. And that's happening a lot around the country. Yep. Uh, these places are shutting down because they can't afford to, to operate anymore because the insurance companies aren't reimbursing. And, uh, uh, my final question, Dr. Stout, yeah. is, you know, one, I noticed one of the folks that uh, gave you a, a quote for, for the back of your book was the producer of a lot of great films, including uh, Whiplash, which I was a big fan of. Yeah. Uh, the, somebody must be making your story into a movie because it's almost, um, it's almost cinematic the way you tell it and the experiences included in the book. What, what's the status of a, a potential film version of this? Well, it's, uh, we have some exciting stuff going on. There's definitely some interest. Um, a, a writer uh, in Los Angeles named Craig Borton who wrote Dallas Buyers Club it's probably a film you've seen. Sure. Yep. He's attached, and uh, we're, we've created a treatment, um, so he wants to write it. And then a great actor in New York named Alessandro Nivola, um, who actually is, is starring in the Soprano, Sopranos prequel that's coming out later this year. Um, he uh, wants to play the lead role, and so we're taking it around right now. And, right. Uh, and we have a lot of that. interest, and, you know, fingers crossed. We'll see it on the. Well, we know uh, how we'll that goes. But, uh, I know. Well, I know. Our fingers are crossed every day. <laughs> uh, doctor, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks really so much appreciate for being it. You yeah. out there, you got to go out and get Lost in Ghost Town. It is a uh, memoir of addiction, redemption, and uh, hope coming from really unlikely places. Thank you very much Thanks for so joining much. us. Really One appreciate it. One more thing it. if you're in New York City tonight and you want to come by the Strand Bookstore. Yes, uh, thank you. Seven o'clock tonight. Um, I'm going to be reading from the book and signing books, and it's going to be a really fun time. Um, so come on by. Check it out. If you're in New York, get down to the Strand tonight. Meet the good doctor. Let him hear it. Let him read it to you in his own words. We're going to take a uh, quick break, and uh, Anna Prouse is going to be here as we work our way up to the one o'clock hour. Uh, we're going to run an Apex commercial or something. Uh, clip.